Hello. This presentation will focus on introduction to addiction psychiatry. Uh, my name is Saurabh Bhartwaj and I'm the medical director of the Addictions Program at UMMC. In this presentation, we'll look at um, some objectives. Um, the first one will be the epidemiology of substance use disorders, uh, looking at some neurobiology relevant to the development of substance use disorders. Uh, we'll also review uh, some clinical criteria um, of how to make a diagnosis and how to stratify. Um, and last, uh, we'll look at treatment options uh, that are available for patients with substance use disorders. Um, the scientific definitions, currently, um, the substance use disorder is defined as a recurrent use of um, any substance, uh, including alcohol or other drugs, that causes clinical and functional impairment. And this could also be in other forms, such as health problems, um, getting a disability, uh, and not being able to uh, meet major responsibilities at work, home, or school. Um, it can be stratified based on level of severity as mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, this is the definition based on the new DSM-5 language. Uh, addiction is a term that's used to indicate the most severe and chronic stage of substance use disorder, which involves substantial loss of self-control, uh, including compulsive drug use, uh, despite a desire to stop using the drug. Um, this is synonymous with the most severe form of substance use disorder uh, per the diagnoses in DSM-5. <clears throat> Epidemiology, um, about 11% of people 12 years of age or older uh, which is about 22 million people, um, have addiction to drugs or alcohol. Uh, and now this is a lifetime prevalence. Uh, the numbers can be slightly higher if we look at um, last 12 month uh, prevalence, uh, but nonetheless, it's a huge number. Uh, abuse of uh, drugs and alcohol um, exacts more than almost a trillion dollars annually in costs, um, which is related to crime, lost work productivity, and healthcare. Um, unfortunately, drug overdoses are now killing many more people than they used to, especially um, since the pandemic has started. Uh, the newer numbers um, have come out uh, for the data from May 2020 through um, July 2021, uh, which shows about 100,000 people have died due to drug overdoses. A uh, majority of these overdose deaths have occurred uh, due to opioid overdose. And most of these opioids are uh, synthetic opioids, such as fentanyl. Um, this slide shows um, some national statistics, and this is number and age adjusted rates uh, for drug overdose deaths. Um, this is 2019 data, um, but the idea behind the slide is to show this is not a one uh, region problem. Uh, this is a problem that's across the United States. Um, all, each and every state is involved in some fashion. Um, and this is a change in um, drug overdose deaths. Now, this is an old data from 2018 to 2019, but um, this also shows that the changes are happening across the states. Um, it's not just the one region um, that's involved. Uh, as you can see, Mississippi has also seen significant increase in the drug overdose deaths um, in the recent past. Um, Prescription opioids have been um, one of the big reasons um, the uh, drug overdose deaths um, were increasing. Um, about 400,000 people have died from a drug overdose, uh, from opioid overdose from 20, uh, 1999 to 2017. Uh, and this has happened over three waves. Uh, as you can see here, uh, in 1990s, there was an increased um, in uh, prescription opioids um, written by the providers that caused um, a lot of prescription opioid overdoses. Um, however, trends started to change uh, somewhere around 2010 when there was a rise in cheap heroin in the market that led to um, you know, a rapid increase in the heroin overdose uh, deaths. And then around 2013 through 2015, we have seen a huge rise in the synthetic opioids that have come in the market that's causing um, uh, increased risk of overdose. The big ones especially are fentanyl, um, carfentanyl, tramadol has also been involved. And uh, as, as we go move along, there's more newer novel uh, opioids that are causing um, overdose deaths. 
Um, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. We have heard this word uh, sentence a long time. Um, uh, and this is actually true. You know, heroin is just uh, part of a larger substance use problem. Um, people who are using one substance are more likely to be addicted to a, another substance. In this case, as you can see, drinking alcohol poses um, twice as likely risk to be addicted to heroin, uh, while your risk increases uh, as you continue to uh, change the, the drugs that you're using. So if you're on pain medications, especially opioids, the risk of getting addicted to heroin is um, 40 times higher. Uh, and that's quite substantial. Uh, this is another slide that shows the rise of the uh, opioid overdose deaths uh, in recent times. As you can see, the three waves that we talked about and synthetic opioids continuing to increase uh, with time. So with that in mind, let's uh, quickly review some neurobiology. For this. Um, this is a, uh, the KUB um, uh, model that a lot of people uh, you, uh, you might know. Uh, this shows the three stages of development of uh, addictions, um, starting from binge and intoxication, um, leading to withdrawal and negative affect states, and uh, eventually people planning and uh, preoccupying themselves with um, uh, just getting the drugs and anticipating the use of the drug to relieve their negative affect states. Um, and these regions, as you see in the slide, um, they, uh, they are the primary regions involved um, for binge and intoxication, it is the, uh, the main region involved is the ventral uh, tegmental area and the dorsal striatum. This is where the main reward system uh, with dopamine effects plays the role. Um, and then leading to the withdrawal and negative affect states, the extended amygdala gets involved. Um, and then all the planning and obtaining the drug happens in the prefrontal cortex. This is another slide showing the same uh, neuroadaptations that are taking place over time, leading to the cycle of use, uh, withdrawal, and um, getting the drug and pre preoccupying themselves with the drug. This is the way the compulsive drug uh, intake happens. Um, drug intake can also be compared to natural rewards. Uh, so survival and addiction might seem very similar um, from the neurocircuitry as well. Um, however, the difference is in the amount of dopamine that gets uh, secreted in the brain in a response to an artificial um, trigger such as a, a substance is much more powerful and many times more um, higher than the natural reward. And this leads to uh, acquisition of maladaptive behaviors over time where the people get mostly focused on obtaining the drug because that's what made um, the, the, the biggest difference in their dopamine uh, reward system. And slowly, uh, as you see, the circuits get strengthened and people just focus on obtaining the drug. And the cycle goes on. In this slide, you can see the shifting drivers for substance use. Initially, when people use, they feel euphoric. Um, but when they don't have the drug, they feel they have reduced energy. But they always look forward to using the drug because it made them feel good. And it was a, just a new feeling that they had. However, over time, as you see, uh, people start to use um, just to escape the dysphoria, the depression. Um, and if they don't have the drug, they feel clinically depressed and anxious and restless. And they're always obsessing and planning to get the drug. And the, uh, the extreme right side happens in the, uh, the most thickest of addictions, uh, which you can equate to the severe substance use disorder diagnoses. Um, this is another busy slide that shows um, some neurobiology um, uh, revolving different substances. Um, the big ones I've shown here are alcohol, opioids, um, sedative hypnotics, uh, th that include benzos, um, amphetamines, and their derivatives, and cocaine. Uh, alcohol tends to be one of those substances that uh, works on a wide variety of receptors. Um, however, the bigger uh, damage it causes is um, cha by changing the fluidity of the membranes uh, with short-term use, uh, but even in long-term use, it can actually make the neuronal membranes rigid and stiff, leading to decrease in the neurotransmission. And that's how you see the depressant effect of the alcohol come by. Opioids, on the other hand, activate exclusively the mu opioid receptor and other uh, opioid receptors as well. Um, however, the dependence is from the mu opioid receptor. Uh, sedatives, on the other hand, work on the GABA receptor um, though they don't act 
at the receptor directly, they, they work on the chloride channel that causes uh, the change in the potentiation leading to the hyperpolarization of the neuron and the activity at the GABA receptor complex. And this causes the depressant effect that benzos are known to cause. Amphetamines, on the other hand, um, act on the catecholamine receptors, uh, particularly dopamine. Um, the difference between amph amphetamine, methamphetamine and cocaine comes down to the way the methamphetamine leads to the release of the dopamine to the vesicles directly to the synapse. Um, and that causes a flood of the dopamine that uh, leads to more severe and uh, excessive flooding of the dopamine in the synapse. And this correlates with longer um, duration of psychosis and intoxication as compared to cocaine, which only blocks the dopamine reuptake, uh, leading to increase in the dopamine in the synapse. So let's discuss quickly uh, the diagnosis and treatment certification. Um, you all might know the DSM-5 diagnoses. So we have these 11 criteria. Now you only need two to make a diagnosis of a substance use disorder. Uh, the four domains, as you see here, are impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and pharmacological tolerance and withdrawal. Uh, this helps in identifying people who have a problem and being able to refer for treatment. ASAM recommends a multimodal um, diagnosis uh, and assessment. Um, we look at these six dimensions uh, before we uh, decide what kind of treatment is need necessary. Uh, and this helps in making sure we uh, provide accurate treatment and not do the same treatment that did not work previously for the patient. We do have evidence-based pharmacological treatments at this time, uh, especially for alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder um, treatments. Uh, as you can see, the FDA has approved uh, th three agents, disulfiram, acamprosate, and naltrexone. Uh, gabapentin is an off-label um, medication that we still use for alcohol use disorder. Uh, for opioid use disorder, we have buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone as three, uh, three FDA-approved agents. And for opioid overdose, naloxone is the only short-acting FDA-approved agent. Uh, other potential treatments have been tried previously, um, including for cocaine and cannabis. However, most were negative studies, um, but there have been some anecdotal reports, and we still do use occasional um, uh, treatments such as bupropion or even mirtazapine, which is an upcoming newer um, agent uh, for treatment of methamphetamine use. Uh, these things are still in trial um, and it, it's not recommended for wide use. Uh, however, as I said, uh, anecdotal use has been reported. Um, this is a slide that shows MAT for uh, alcohol use disorder. MAT stands for medication assisted treatment. Um, and we talked about dalselfram and Altrexan and Acamprosate. These are the three options that are currently available. Um, medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, uh, we have three agents currently available as we discussed, methadone, buprenorphine, and, and naltrexone. Uh, methadone is a full agonist, while buprenorphine is a partial agonist, uh, and naltrexone is a competitive um, antagonist. Um, methadone is a synthetic long-acting opioid receptor agonist, which is a full um, agonist. Uh, it's a mixture of two enantiomers, um, and the R has the 10 times affinity for the mu opioid receptor. Um, it also antagonizes the NMDA receptor. However, we're not aware of any uh, major clinical uh, benefit from that. Uh, it is available in both liquid and pill forms, um, and it reaches a uh, plasma concentration in two to three hours. Um, currently, liquid forms are uh, used in uh, the OTPs, which are the opioid treatment programs that uh, pr uh, prescribe methadone for uh, opioid use disorder treatment. Buprenorphine is a semi-synthetic uh, opio mu opioid receptor partial agonist. Um, it is a weak and a potent um, agonist. However, it has a very tight binding affinity for the mu opioid receptor, about a thousand times more than that of morphine, uh, which leads to significant beneficial blocking effects at the receptor once the patients have uh, buprenorphine in their system. And if any additional opioid is taken on top of buprenorphine, uh, it will not displace the buprenorphine from the receptor. And therefore, it will not work and prevent the uh, drug from acting. 
So this is a major, major change, and this has helped increase the access to care, given that it can be prescribed by any physician who has um, an X waiver, uh, which can be obtained by any specialty provider. Uh, we also have evidence-based psychosocial treatments, including CBT, contingency management, self-help groups like AANA, and group therapy. Uh, contingency management uses length of prescription as a contingency, and you can use that tool as a reinforcer. You can change the length of the prescriptions from a week to 30 days based on the drug screen results, and this is the technique that we use in our clinics um, as, as a tool. Uh, to increase reten retention in treatment and improve the outcomes. Uh, so therefore, there is benef benefits in viewing addiction as a disease model. Uh, it, is, it is a disease of the brain, must be treated like any other chronic illness, and, and we have available pharmacological and psychological treatments. And there are plenty of uh, benefits uh, of viewing addictions as a disease model, in including you know, leading to reforms um, and also increased research. We do have services at UMC currently, including an addiction clinic at River Chase Clinic. We provide comprehensive treatment, dual diagnostic services, MAT, uh, and psychosocial treatments. Um, and hopefully we will be expanding in the near future.